Mountain Folk, Book One of the Folklore Cycle by John Hood, narrated by Benjamin Fife. Chapter One, The Hunters. September 1751. Daniel thought he spotted wings in the trees, but he couldn't be sure. He'd been hunting on the rugged mountain since morning. Now it was nearly dusk. He was tired and more than a little hungry. To make matters worse, the fog rising above the little creek he'd been following was getting thicker, swirling around the oaks and pines on the hillside. But Daniel never let fog or waning sunlight keep him from bagging game back home in Pennsylvania on Never Sink Mountain. He wouldn't leave this mountain empty-handed either. He knew his mother Sarah would already be at the campfire, boiling beans and preparing spits for roasting whatever he brought back. They had some venison left from previous hunts, so no one would go to bed hungry, but quail, partridge, or even pigeon would be a welcome respite from chewing on stringy venison. Truly, though, it was now a matter of pride. Daniel, the best hunter in the family, rarely returned without a prize. He usually returned with several. Sure, hunting was easier in familiar surroundings. Back home, he'd known intimately the hills, valleys, and forests that lay between their farm in Oli and the bustling city of Philadelphia. Now, these familiar places were far behind them. Over many months, Daniel and his family had traveled hundreds of miles, following the path of other settlers through Virginia into the back country of North Carolina. Some days earlier, his father had spotted rocky cliffs thrust improbably high against the otherwise flat horizon. The family had headed for them. Now their camp lay in the shade of the tallest mountain. Daniel had traipsed up and over it, following the sound of rushing water to a striking waterfall and the little creek beyond. The place was unfamiliar, yes, but hunting was hunting. Even at sixteen, Daniel was a master. Everybody said so. Back in Pennsylvania, he'd earned more selling furs and hides in Philadelphia than he had working in his father's fields and forge. He knew from experience that where there was fresh water, there was bound to be game. He wasn't about to be defeated this night, on this mountainside, by a few wisps of fog. What was that? Daniel saw movement in the thicket. He stopped short, placing one moccasin silently next to the other in the soft leaves as he hefted his well-worn hunting rifle and peered into the tangle of low trees and vines. He stayed frozen in place for what seemed like an eternity. Although confident in his ability as a marksman, Daniel didn't want to risk his game taking flight. With a rifle, it was a whole lot easier to hit a treed bird than one on the wing. Folks usually needed a fowling gun for the latter. Daniel listened intently. Presently, his keen ears picked up some rustling in the thicket, along with the sound of tree branches scraping together behind him and what seemed like footfalls in the fallen leaves much farther down the creek. Were there three birds in earshot, or something else? Slowly, carefully, he cocked his rifle. Then, several things happened at once. The thicket suddenly exploded into a mass of shaggy fur, bared teeth, and beastly rage. Behind him, he heard a rustle of branches, and he heard a faint, eerie scream, like nothing he'd ever heard in years of hunting and tracking. Perhaps that's why he jerked. Perhaps that's why his finger yanked the trigger prematurely, rather than squeezing it. Perhaps that's why Daniel Boone missed. The huge black bear, for, of course, that's what was charging the young hunter at ferocious speed, wasn't at all startled by the report of the rifle. Daniel swore, drew his hunting knife, and turned to run. He'd tangled with bears before. There was no chance for him to reload. There was little chance of playing dead and placating the bear, and there was little chance of outrunning it, particularly since Daniel had been following the creek downhill and would now have to run up a slope. There was, in fact, little chance of surviving the encounter at all. But Daniel Boone was no coward. 
he'd run as fast as he could and then put up a determined, probably doomed, fight. As he turned on a heel to begin his flight, he saw wings. He'd have paid them little heed had the wings been attached to what he expected to see, the back of a game bird. But what Daniel Boone beheld was just about the furthest thing he'd ever expected to see along that creek, in those woods, or anywhere on God's green earth. He saw a small, lithe, human-like body flying through the air. Daniel saw the wings beat and then straighten as the little creature banked toward the rampaging bear. He saw one slender arm holding a bow and another slender arm pulling an arrow back to a faintly whiskered chin. He heard the minuscule bowstring twang. Fast as lightning, Daniel whirred to see the bear stiffen, an arrow sticking out from its neck. He saw the bowman reloading his weapon and lifting his left wing to bank around the head of the bear, whose jaws were thrown open in pain and rage. And Daniel saw, even before the archer did, a furry paw swinging up with blinding speed. It struck the winged creature with tremendous force, knocking the little man against a pine trunk. From there, the bowman fell to the ground, hard. Even as he witnessed the savage swipe, Daniel was hurtling toward the wounded bear, holding his knife in the reverse grip of his right hand and wielding his rifle as a club in his left. He'd never heard of a man beating a bear in a hand-to-paw fight, but he didn't hesitate. The wonder he felt upon seeing a real-life fairy, for that was surely what lay senseless or worse before him, did not keep Daniel Boone from acting. The deepest instinct of self-preservation, to kill or be killed, combined with the highest instinct of honor, gave speed and strength to his limbs. With his left arm, Daniel dealt the bear a terrific blow with the butt of his gun. Then, with his right, he plunged his knife deep into the breast of the bear, through the shaggy hide, into the savage heart. How he got close enough to deliver these attacks, Daniel didn't know. He'd killed bears before, but with a bullet from his rifle. He knew the look of death. The bear fell forward on its face, wrenching Daniel's blade from his grasp, and moved no more. A moment later, Daniel was crouching below the pine tree, gazing in astonishment at the crumpled form of the fairy. The little creature was lying on his stomach, his apparently undamaged wings of yellow-tinged feathers, glistening in the twilight as if dusted in gold, retracted onto his back. He wore a cloak of forest green over what appeared to be a leather jerkin and woolen stockings. From a rough belt hung a couple of leather pouches and a blade that bore no small resemblance to Daniel's own hunting knife, except in its tiny size. Another strap bearing a quiver of arrows crossed the fairy's torso from right shoulder to left hip. The bow lay a few inches away. The fairy was about the height of a large raccoon, Daniel judged. Unsure what to do, he reached out a hand and carefully turned the fairy onto his back. The creature's face was youthful and handsome, but his delicate features were contorted in an expression of anguish. Fearful the fairy had sustained a mortal blow, Daniel was both surprised and delighted when the little eyelids fluttered open revealing light brown eyes. Daniel was even more surprised, if not exactly delighted, to see the fairy's lips move and to hear a soft voice uttering words he understood. You, you blundering human, the fairy said haltingly, between winces. Your recklessness almost got us both killed by that fearsome beast. Daniel's concern gave way to annoyance. I just killed that beast and saved your life, sir he pointed out. You should be more grateful. Grateful? The fairy coughed and tried to sit up, grimacing. You did not save me, and because of you my quarry may have escaped. Thanks to you my first solo ranging may end in failure. I may not get another chance to become a journeyman for a long time. Daniel would have responded in anger with little of the Christian charity his parents, Squire and Sarah Boone, had tried to teach him, but his feelings of sympathy and wonder took over. This was a fairy lying before him, a real, flying, talking fairy. It was one of Mother's bedtime stories come to life. 
It was impossible and ridiculous, but it was happening. Daniel stroked his chin, smiling quizzically. Maybe I ought to be the one upset, friend, he said. I wasn't hunting bear. I was hunting fowl for supper. Even so, I reckon I would have hit the beast square on the nose and finished him if you hadn't distracted me with that weird little shout. What shout? the fairy demanded, his eyes showing sudden enthusiasm. What did you hear? I was too busy rescuing you to notice. Perhaps your gigantic ears can hear far-off sounds that my normal ears cannot. Bemused, Daniel looked at the little man. Normal ears. The fairy's small ears were elongated and ended in points. I heard what sounded like wings fluttering behind me, and then a strange cry, Daniel said. I figured you did it. I've heard Indian friends do battle cries before. Wasn't you? No, of course not, the fairy responded, shakily getting to his feet. Now that I figure it, Daniel continued, seems like the sound came from downhill a ways. I thought I heard something down there. At the time, I thought it was a bird. The fairy shook his head. Whether it was to indicate disagreement or to regain his senses, Daniel couldn't tell. What you heard was the cry of the beast I have been tracking for a while. For days in your time, the fairy explained. I was so close. I almost had it. But then I chose to help you. I may have saved one life at the cost of many more. Daniel watched as the fairy moved his hands down to one of the leather pouches hanging from his belt. He rummaged inside it, let out a cry of alarm, and withdrew two small cylinders. Daniel drew closer to examine them. It is destroyed, the fairy wailed. Now I will never be able to find the beast again. Daniel saw that the object was a silver-colored musical instrument broken cleanly in two. How can that little pipe help you track game? Daniel asked. The fairy glared at him for a moment, then his expression softened. I suppose there is no harm in telling you, he said, still rubbing his forehead where his hard fall had raised a welt. I will not need it to produce a simple spell song, which is all I will need for you. And now that I have lost my quarry, I might as well tell my troubles to someone. I have been alone on the trail so long that even a conversation with the likes of you would be welcome. Well, that's mighty generous of you, Daniel said, a playful smile curling his lips. I've only been hunting since breakfast, but I wouldn't mind a little company either, even from the likes of you. For an instant, irritation mingled with frustration on the fairy's face. Then he caught Daniel's twinkling eye and let out a snort of merry laughter. Well said, sir. Well said. And well met. My name is Gorin. Whom have I the pleasure to meet? I'm Daniel Boone, said the young hunter, shaking the fairy's proffered hand. My family's camped a little ways from here. We've only just arrived in these parts, looking for a good piece of land to settle on. We're originally from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, you say? said Gorin. I know it well. My folks stayed there for many of your years, within the shade of a low mountain in a place the humans call Bucks County. Why, that's not far from where I grew up, in Berks County. Daniel replied eagerly. You're a long way from home, just like I am. Gorin looked searchingly at Daniel for a moment, then smiled. You have no idea. Yet, in a way, the histories of your people and mine are intertwined. Where humans live, we live. Where you go, we are unlikely to be far behind. Now it was Daniel's turn to gaze meaningfully at the fairy, who still seemed dazed as he rose fully to his feet and returned the broken flute to his pouch. What do you mean by that? And why do you keep saying my years instead of just years? Do you reckon the days differently? Goran sighed and looked longingly into the fog. It is a long story, and more trouble than it is worth for me to tell you. You will never remember it anyway. Daniel pursed his lips. I may not be as skilled at reading and doing figures as some, but nobody has ever doubted my memory. That's one reason I'm pretty good at hunting. It doesn't take me long to draw a map in my head of where I've been. I can recall just about every bird call I've ever heard. I can tell one footprint from another. Trust me, friend. My mind's like a bear trap. 
Trust me, friend. Goran repeated the phrase with a chuckle. After you and I part, that memory trap of yours is going to be empty. At least, when it comes to me. I am not such a novice that I need my flute for that. The fairy held up a hand as Daniel began to reply. Hold on, listen to me, Goran objected. I said I would explain about the flute. I will tell you what you need to know. If you are such a skilled tracker, perhaps I can still catch up to the beast. Perhaps my ranging will not be in vain. Daniel Boone had countless questions. He didn't like to be told no, but the idea of tracking unfamiliar prey intrigued him, while Goran's implied test of Daniel's abilities excited him. Holding his tongue, he nodded to the little man. Back in my village, I am an apprentice in the Rangers Guild, the fairy began. We train for many tasks. We scout. We track game to fill our larders and dining tables. We convey messages across long distances. And when it becomes necessary to deal with humans, we are trained for that too. That is why I know your language. I was wondering about that, Daniel said. Does that mean you also know? Please do not interrupt, Goran interjected. If there is still a chance to find the beast, it will not last long. Let us proceed while I talk. Daniel stooped over the bear, withdrew his knife, and cleaned the blade on the tail of his buckskin shirt. Returning the knife to its sheath, he picked up his rifle and began walking briskly along the creek. Goran fluttered his wings, gingerly at first, then with deliberate strokes. Another job of the ranger, perhaps the most important of all, is to find and track the monsters that prowl beyond our borders— beyond our walls of magecraft and spellsong that protect us from the blur. The what? Daniel asked. The blur. It is a word we use to describe your human world, Goran said. You see, we folk are not from this realm, not originally. We experience time differently from the way you do. In our villages, behind our shimmer walls, time passes at a rate that is normal for us, but would seem extremely slow to you. A day in our time is like a score of days in yours. If we stand at the very edge of our domains and look through the magical barriers that protect us, the grass, trees, waters, and creatures of your world look like they are in constant motion. To us it is a blur. I don't understand what you're saying, Daniel said, his brows knitted in a questioning frown. To be honest, Daniel— I do not understand it very well myself, the fairy admitted. The details are really a topic for mages, not rangers. I do not know how magecraft works, or even how the spell song used by rangers works. I just know that it does. We spend years, that is, our years, learning how to wield the magic of music. We sing spells to cloud the senses and conceal ourselves. We use it to find other magical creatures and exchange messages over short distances, and we use it to alter emotions. With the right verse or melody, I can make you feel proud or fearful, joyful or wistful, even bring you to laughter or tears. Daniel chuckled softly. That doesn't sound so different from what I've seen a good fiddle player or hymn singer do back home. Were they fairy bards too? That is an interesting question. Goran replied with a knowing smile. Perhaps they were. As I said, we can use spell song to influence the moods and perceptions of humans and other weak-minded creatures. You may well have met some of my kind before, but you do not recall them, at least not the way you are seeing me now. Our spell song alters memory, too. Daniel found this explanation hard to grasp. He wasn't sure he wanted to grasp it. But back to what you need to know the fairy said. For more complicated feats of song magic, for those involving highly resistant targets, for example, our unaided voices can prove inadequate. We use instruments enchanted by our craftsmen to focus and amplify spell song. Like your broken flute, Daniel cut in. Now I'm beginning to see your trouble. Without it, you can't use your power to track that magical beast from far off because it doesn't want to be tracked. It'll resist you. Goran swooped in front of Daniel's face and hovered. I can see fortune has been most generous. You are not just brave, but rather perceptive, for a human. 
So, you will help me to complete my mission? Daniel stooped and set down his rifle by the creek, plunging both hands into the cool mountain water and cupping them to bring drink to his lips. He stood up, ran a damp hand through his dark, unruly hair, and turned back to the ferry still suspended in midair, his wings beating a graceful, steady rhythm. From what you've been telling me, I'm not sure how a mere human could be of much service, Daniel said dryly. I can't conjure up spells. All I can do is hunt fowl and rabbit and deer, and occasionally bear. I even killed a cougar once, though I wasn't rightly hunting it at the time. Fortune truly favors us, exclaimed the fairy. That is exactly what I am after, a giant cat. Well, cougars are way bigger than ordinary cats and mighty powerful, Daniel replied, picking up his gun and resuming his rapid pace. I wouldn't want to tangle with one if I didn't have to, but I'd hardly call them giants. What I have been tracking is no ordinary wildcat, Daniel, Gorin said, his expression suddenly grave as he flew alongside Daniel. It is something far more dangerous. You could not pronounce the name in our tongue, I suspect, but humans sometimes call it a wampus cat. It is a bit longer than you are tall, powerfully muscled, incredibly fast, with long, sharp teeth. As you may have guessed, it draws on magical forces to enhance its strength and speed. And this is a bit gruesome. The wampus cat does not feed on its kills in a normal way. It bites the neck and, well... It drains the lifeblood from its victims while their hearts still beat. Daniel cast a revolted look the fairy's way, but didn't interrupt his stride. I've heard campfire stories about big cats, but never anything like that. You aired only shadows of the truth, Goran said. Back in what you call the British Isles, where my folk resided before we journeyed to America— Local humans also told stories of monstrous cats with magical abilities. The Scots called them the Cat She. In Cornwall, where I was born, I often aired human bards sing of a legendary beast, Cat Palog, that slew 180 people before a hero named King Arthur managed to overcome him. It did not really happen like that, of course. I'm beginning to think that lots of things I thought I knew— or perhaps lots of things that lots of us thought we knew, have not been quite so, Daniel said with another chuckle. But if the giant cat we're talking about is really that fearsome, how do you expect to defeat it? I mean, no offense, Goran, but if we're talking about some kind of giant cougar, it would dwarf the likes of you. Even my trusty rifle and I may be no match for it. The fairy shrugged his shoulders in what struck Daniel as a very human expression. I never had any intention of facing it on my own. Capturing, or if necessary, killing a monster of this size is a job for hunters, or even warriors, not of rangers. Our task is to establish a clear location of the quarry, and then use spell song to send the location back. Teams of folk stand ready to respond to such calls, they arrive and take care of the beast. What do you need me to do, then? asked Daniel. We folk have many talents and skills, but, as you pointed out, we are comparatively small in your Brobdenagian world, the fairy said. Hey, I know that word. You've read Gulliver's Travels? That's one of my favorite books. Please stop interrupting. Of course I am familiar with the adventures of Gulliver, more personally familiar than you would ever guess. Goran said, clearly relishing Daniel's astonishment. But we were talking about the realm of men. You are fitted to it. Your senses are attuned to it. I never heard the footfalls. That piercing cry? I did not hear that either. I am hoping that, with my spell song and your sharp ears, working together we can corner the prey. Trying desperately to suppress his curiosity, Daniel stopped short and reached for his powder horn. All right, Goran he said, as he began loading his gun. Let's try whatever you had in mind. While the beast may well be ahead of us, it's also possible it's changed direction. Better be sure we're headed the right way. The fairy grunted his assent. He banked, turned, and landed lightly on Daniel's left shoulder. The young hunter was taken aback for a second, then relaxed. 
He had made friends with Gorin and agreed to help him after all. Time to follow his lead. Clearing his throat and turning his face upward, Gorin sang. To Daniel, whose ear was very close to the fairy's mouth, it seemed as if the song wasn't coming from just that one place, but from every direction at once. It sang of misty mornings, of cool evenings, of damp hiding places, of hunger, of longing. It was a song Daniel had never heard before, yet it felt like a familiar dream of countless nights. He recognized not a single word of the language Goran sang. But by searching his feelings, Daniel found he could understand its meaning a little, perhaps a great deal more than that. And then the young human heard himself answering the fairy's song with a plaintive cry of his own. No, wait, that's not my voice at all, Daniel realized. It was a shrill, high-pitched sound. It was like the cry he'd heard just before the bear came crashing out of the thicket. Only this time, Daniel could sense some of its meaning. A hint of loneliness, an eagerness to find comfort, but also the suggestion of wariness of barely restrained ferocity. Feeling a thrill of excitement, Daniel gave a nod. I can hear it, Gorin. Keep singing and follow me. For the better part of an hour, the two searchers followed the cries. Sometimes Gorin flew high, extending the range of his spell song. Other times, he alighted on the human's shoulder and let Daniel propel the two, as the effort required to amplify his spell song without his enchanted flute, fatigued the fairy ranger. Slowly but surely, they gained on their quarry. Daniel longed to ask Goran why the cat wasn't running toward them, since the fairy's song sounded more enticing than menacing. That was only one of many questions Daniel had. How would the other fairies find them? How could the fairies be so close that they'd arrive in time? And, given the tiny size of their bodies and weapons, how could even a squadron of fairies manage to subdue the monster Goran described? But there was no time for questions. The fairy needed to sing. Daniel needed to listen, track, climb, and run. And he also needed to think about what he would do when they caught up with the beast. The moment came without warning. It had been a few minutes since Daniel last heard the cat's responsive cry. As the young hunter weaved his way through a line of trees, he heard it again. So loud it was almost deafening. Then the searchers broke into a small clearing formed by a handful of downed trees and rotten logs, and Daniel glimpsed for the first time what they'd been chasing through the cool Carolina evening. The monster was a cat, yes, and more. Its face was feline but elongated, its jaws jutting forward with an almost lupine suggestion. It was improbably massive, frightfully imposing, and covered with stripes. Its legs, short and stubby, were out of proportion to its long body. Its paws were out of proportion too, wider and with claws that made Daniel's hunting knife look like a dainty piece of silverware, fit only for a Philadelphia dinner table. Most terrifying of all were the cat's huge, tawny eyes. They weren't just filled with enormous yellow-orange pupils. The eyes glowed yellow-orange. To Daniel, they looked like a blazing fire. No, on second thought, like yellow-orange thunderclouds about to erupt with yellow-orange bolts of lightning. And those eyes, those fiery eyes of that fiery cat, were looking directly into Daniel's eyes of cold blue. Without hesitation, in a move honed to perfection from years on the frontier, with a calm assurance that had failed him earlier in his confrontation with the bear, Daniel Boone lifted his rifle to a solid shoulder, trained a steady eye down its barrel, took careful aim at a target of yellow-orange, and smoothly squeezed the trigger. The rifle shot rang out, and, from high above Daniel's head, something else rang out. A new song from Goran, a very different one, short, focused, commanding. Daniel couldn't tell if he'd scored a hit. Then what happened next captured his attention. The air around him began to shimmer with light and crackle with sparks. He felt a great force against his body, like a wind, first pushing relentlessly against him and then 
as if this were possible, passing rapidly through him. An instant later, Daniel found that he, the fairy, and the wampus cat were no longer alone. The clearing was filled with many other figures. They were Goran's size, but dressed and outfitted differently. Some of the fairies, aloft, held bows with arrows fitted. Others had their bows strapped across their backs, and instead held thin spears, their points directed squarely at the cat, their ends connected to ropes coiled in the fairy's other hands. Still others stood stoutly on the ground, in what looked like a military formation, holding thicker spears and round shields. Both the bronze bosses on their shields and the scale armor worn by these grounded fairies glowed metallic red. Strangest looking of all, in the opinion of their human beholder, were the fairies who stood along the perimeter of what Daniel could now see was a bubble of shimmering light encompassing the entire hunting party and its prey. These new arrivals wore not short cloaks like Goran's, but instead flowing robes extending to their feet. The robes were variously colored and decorated with a bewildering array of signs, runes, and other figures Daniel didn't recognize, as were the pointed hats on their heads. They were the only ones not looking at the wampus cat. Instead, their gazes were fixed on the shimmering walls of the encircling bubble, and on their own hands, from which glistening beams of moonlight, or something like it, kept emerging. As Daniel took it all in, this weird and wondrous tableau, the stuff of bedtime stories and childhood daydreams, its elements moved swiftly. Daniel saw the flying archers release their arrows and reload. He saw the flying javelin men hurl their darts and grab onto their ropes with both hands. He saw the armored spearmen march forward and around their quarry. And he saw the cat, that lightning-eyed cat not out of a dream but out of a nightmare, its mouth snarling and biting the air, lose its footing, stumble, and sink to the ground. Twice it struggled to rise and fend off its attackers, knocking some roughly to the ground with powerful swipes of its paws. Twice it failed. Then the wampus cat rose no more. "'You hit it, Daniel. You hit it right in the head!' exclaimed Goran some time later, after Daniel had sunk to the forest floor himself in a state of shock. "'You did not deal it a mortal wound, thankfully.' but you definitely stunned the beast and made it easier to capture without loss of life. The fairy ranger swooped down to sit on a fallen log. You are very brave, my friend, and I couldn't have tracked it without you. My first solo ranging has ended in success. I am sure to get my guild invitation. Daniel nodded, rubbing his eyes in fatigue, just to make sure he hadn't been seeing things all along. Those arrows of yours— they aren't just pointed sticks, are they? He asked the fairy. No, Daniel, they are not. Our craftsmen forge the arrowheads with enchanted metal. The ones we use tonight are designed to bring on sleep. So are the tips of the spears we used. As I told you, we prefer to subdue the monsters, to confine them. We only kill as a last resort. I hunt for food, or to make pelts to sell, Daniel said. I guess that's not what your people have in mind. Goran's disgusted expression was all the answer Daniel needed. That means, then, that even that bear back there, the one I thought I saved you from, was already going to keel over before I ever charged it, Daniel said. You really saved me from him, like you said. Not necessarily, Goran assured him. That was an enormous animal. A single piercing by my sleep arrow may not have brought it down for some time, if at all. As you can see, it took numerous shots to bring down the wampus cat, and your bear was actually a bit larger. Larger? Yep. But a bear is just a bear. This thing is something more. It's magical, just like you and your friends. Spellsong, magecraft, shimmer spells. I can't begin to take it all in. Goran stood up and leveled a gaze at Daniel. You will not need to, Daniel he said reassuringly, but also with a tinge of sadness. You have had quite an adventure this day. Please know that I will always appreciate the service you rendered to me, my profession, my folk, and indeed your own people, 
because monsters are as great a threat to you as they are to us. The fairy looked the young hunter up and down. Are you injured? I can call one of the mages over. You will find that magecraft is superior to any healing arts your people possess. I'm fine, Gorin, just fine and dandy, Daniel said. He sighed and got to his feet. You were talking about our adventure tonight. I think you were about to tell me that I won't remember any of it tomorrow. That is right, Daniel. You are most perceptive. When our work brings us in contact with humankind, our ranger code requires us to sing songs of forgetfulness afterwards. Daniel picked up his rifle and began to reload it. Goran looked startled. You never know, I might still be able to get a pheasant on the way home, Daniel explained. Don't like the idea of showing up without what I went hunting for. Oh, I see, the fairy said, visibly relieved. I thought for a moment that you had some wild idea about trying to resist. Believe me, I wish there were some other way. I have made a new friend today. Daniel looked back at Gorin, a new light in his eyes. A while ago you said something about how where humans live, you live. And where humans go, you are unlikely to be far behind. What did you mean? If I'm to lose my memory, what's the harm in satisfying my curiosity for the moment? The fairy laughed. Why not indeed? You speak plainly. You cut right to the heart of the matter. So I will speak plainly too. He waved his hand at the fairies finishing their work, trussing the wampus cat in strands of what looked like ordinary rope, but probably wasn't. We are not from your world, Daniel, but we must live alongside it, Goran said. We only want to survive, as you do. We act to protect our homes and families, but we also act to protect you humans. When we find that we must intervene in your affairs, sometimes it is to save ourselves, other times it is to save you from yourselves, from your human follies. It is nothing you need to worry about, though. We only do it for your own good. Daniel didn't much like the sound of that, but he chose to keep his own counsel on the matter. Instead, he asked, If your spells are so good at scouring memories, Gorin, then how come I knew what you were when I saw you? How come we humans know about fairies and magic and monsters at all? The fairy shook his head in amazement. Again, Daniel, very astute of you. Our spell song is far from perfect. Nothing in your realm or any other can be perfect. As a rule, our songs eliminate any memory of us from a human mind. There are, however, exceptions to every rule. Some human memories survive spell song, but they are hazy, jumbled, incomplete. Such memories pose little danger. I've recalled daydreams suffused with fantasy and longing that fuel your imaginations and inspire your storytellers. Gorin turned and nodded at the other fairies who circled the bound, unconscious monster. Daniel gaped as the robed ones made signs with their arms and appeared to draw in the shimmering light previously emanating from their fingertips. Daniel again felt a mysterious wind and saw a flicker like the flame of a candle. In an instant, the fairies vanished, all except Gorin. He fluttered his wings and lifted off the fallen log, I know you will not understand this either, Daniel, but I am an exception myself. You see, for most of my folk, existing in your world, beyond our protective shimmer is possible for only brief passages of time before we go mad or perish. A few of us are born different, though. We possess certain qualities that allow us to live long stretches of time in your world. We become rangers." Gorin looked into the distance with a melancholy expression, as if seeing not what the fairy's eyes beheld in Daniel's world, but instead what lay in the fairy's own memories. We do not have all the answers ourselves, make no mistake, Gorin continued. No one knows for sure how long even highly resistant, well-trained rangers can survive in the blur. But tasks must be performed there. We need resources, supplies, protection and the monster peril must be contained. The fairy was right. Daniel hadn't understood what Goran said, not fully, but he could read the signs that were as plain as the nose on his new friend's face. He knew their conversation was nearing its end. One final time, Daniel. 
I offer you my deepest appreciation for all you have done, and I extend to you my heartfelt goodbye. Farewell, friend, the human hunter responded. Best of luck until we meet again. Alas, the fairy said, we will never meet again. And then he began to sing. It was a tired Daniel Boone who trudged along the banks of the mountain creek. On top of that, he was mighty hungry. He was looking forward to beans and venison when he got back to camp. Should I try one more time to shoot up some game? Daniel had great confidence in his skill with his rifle, but even the greatest marksman who ever lived would struggle to hit a bird, treed or otherwise, in the pitch black of night. Besides, he'd already fired his rifle twice that day. Shot and powder weren't easy to come by, not back home in Pennsylvania and certainly not in the more remote Carolina backcountry. Daniel supposed this would just have to be one of those rare times he went on a hunt and came back with nothing but a tall tale. Actually, in this case, he'd have to come back with even less. And besides, there wouldn't be anyone awake to hear a tale. The Boons would all have been asleep for hours when he got back to camp. Or would it be daybreak by then? Daniel got to thinking again about the cold beans and dried venison. I wonder what fairies eat for supper, he asked out loud, to no one in particular. I never got a chance to ask, and Gorin never volunteered anything about it. Oh well, the fairy was free to keep whatever secrets he wished. Daniel was good at keeping secrets too. Chapter 2 The Knob During his weeks away from home, on his first solo ranging, Gorin had taken every opportunity he could to soar above the tree line, above the world of humankind. Aloft he felt safe and free, a ground he felt small and alone. Now, having finally completed his mission, Gorin was flying west as fast as his tired wings could manage through the stillness of a moonlit night to the knob. He was flying toward a warm welcome, a sumptuous feast, a father's pride, a sister's embrace. He was flying home. The journey would be brief. While Gorin had tracked the Catawampari back and forth for weeks, zigging and zagging through forests and hills, his hunt had ended on a mountainside only about twenty miles east of his home. Almost immediately he could see the knob's distinctive gray cliffs shining in the moonlight, which also danced across the leaves of its green-topped dome. The sight thrilled Gorin and spurred him to beat his wings still harder. Rangers born to the task and rigorously trained could spend long stretches in the blur. It was their responsibility. Many even found meaning, diversion, and pleasure in their work beyond the shimmer. But the human world would never be theirs. It would never be home. As he approached the knob, Gorin banked left and turned to approach the south entrance to the Sylph village. Landing first on the branch of a chestnut oak, he glided to the rocky ground next to a rhododendron bush, its palette of pink-purple blossoms conjuring up cherished memories of wandering through his mother Winna's elaborate garden. Of course, there had been no flowers native to America in that garden. Gorin's childhood had been spent far over the sea in Cornwall. The sylphs had lived there for generations atop a hill the humans called Brown Willie. Winna's garden there had boasted daisy, buttercup, spring quill, broom, and gorse, along with ferns, heath, a range of medicinal herbs, and a small apple tree. But the garden was on the far edge of the sylph settlement, distantly removed from the village proper. The garden was, therefore, still back on Cornwall's brown willy. It hadn't made the crossing. Gorin remembered the crossing as if it were yesterday. Indeed, it hadn't been all that long ago, although his lengthy trips in the blur meant that the crossing was further in his past than it was to his friends and family. The sylphs had, in truth, only just arrived in the Carolina backcountry a few months earlier. Before that, their village had been secreted for some years on a low ridge in Pennsylvania called Haycock Mountain. Before that, before the crossing, 
the sylphs had lived on Brown Willie for generations, so it wasn't really the sight of the knob itself that filled Gorin with longing. The sight of Haycock Mountain wouldn't have either. What thrilled him was the mental image of the sylph village within, of its cherished halls and walls and faces. That, not the distinctive outline of the knob, was what truly drew him home. Looking past the rhododendron bush and up the cliffside, Gorin saw a telltale glow. It was the shimmer, the wall of magecraft and spellsong that surrounded the village, contained its time and energies, and protected it from incursion. Most earthly creatures couldn't see it at all. Magical creatures had no trouble spotting the wall, but couldn't traverse it without voicing or playing the proper musical phrase. Gorin approached the shimmer and began humming. He felt the familiar tingle of magic from head to foot. He felt the wall give way as he pushed through. As Gorin headed toward the settlement, his eyes scanned instinctively for flora in the orange light of dawn. Perhaps his meandering thoughts about his mother's Cornish garden had suggested the idea. But, of course, there were no lush gardens here, not yet. The sylphs hadn't been on the knob long enough. Sylph green weavers were still experimenting with the local vegetation, learning how to infuse plants with magic so they could sprout and flourish in surroundings quite different from their native soil, in a place where time could not be reckoned by the rising and setting of a sun that streaked through the heavens twenty times a day. It was one of the oddest things to get used to in the blur, that sun. Behind the shimmer, in a folk realm, the sun was barely discernible in a sky shrouded by mist and refracted by magic. As a child, Gorin had spent hours lying in the cool grass, gazing up at that misty sky. It lightened and darkened on a nearly hourly basis, cycling through a spectrum of hazy, diffused colors. In the blur, however, the colors became sharper, lusher, and slower. The daytime sun burned so fiercely that direct observation was impossible. During his first ranging into the blur, what had really captured Gorin's attention and his imagination was the moon, that lustrous nighttime visitor. As rangers traveled most safely by night anyway, the moon had become his constant companion during his hunt. Gorin bore to his left to give a wide berth to the monster pens on the outskirts of the village. If there had been a lush green garden, he'd have been heading into it. In fact, he glided over a small enclosure and a plowed field beyond, but they contained only a few sprouts here and there, green weaver experiments that might one day blossom into beds and groves, that one day remained far off. Indeed, the village greenweavers would have been further along in their enchantments had they retained the services of their most talented gardener. But she hadn't made the crossing either. When his grave marker lay back in Cornwall, in her brown willy garden beneath the spreading branches of her prized gillyflower apple tree. Gorin mused for a moment about the knob. The sylphs had been fortunate to find the place— a mountaintop so well crafted for magical concealment that it must have been the site of a village long since abandoned by some other folk. At best, the sharpest-eyed human could have seen nothing more than an occasional mysterious glimmer in the foliage above the cliffs. Even when some human eyes saw through the shimmer, they couldn't make sense of what lay beyond— an expanse of grass, trees, buildings, and streets far more extensive within the shimmer than could be seen from without. With scarcely a hundred strides, humans could trace the perimeter of the village and never guess that an entire community of sylphs lived within its seemingly tight confines. But, of course, humans lived non-magical lives. Goran felt sorry for them. As he landed and walked into the settlement, the orange sky began its transformation to light blue. Halls and homes bustled with activity, tradesmen and craftsmen clad in tunics and stockings of brightly colored wools and linens were pushing carts along streets or carrying bags and baskets as they flew overhead. Mages, 
green weavers, and other scholars wearing luxurious robes and fur-lined cloaks, either scurried on their way to appointments or wandered aimlessly, seemingly lost in thought. Armored soldiers leaned against walls and posts, polishing the bosses on their shields, or telling ribald jokes, or doing not much of anything at all. Two hooded hunters stood in front of a butcher shop, holding aloft the opposite ends of a pole from which two skinned rabbits hung, the result of a recent larder hunt, no doubt. Mothers and fathers minded playful children, or hustled them homeward. Some sylphs were talking, some were laughing, some were arguing. It was all delightful. Gorin, you have returned! The young ranger felt slender arms wrap tenderly around him and draw him into a tight hug. Turning, he found his sister Ailey, looking up with joyful eyes. Her long chestnut hair stretched halfway down the back of her dark green gown, which was cinched at the waist with a buff-colored belt. "'We've only just heard the news from the hunting party, Gorin. You did it? You found the monster? I am so proud of you!' Goran gave Ailey an affectionate kiss on one flushed cheek and freed himself gently from her embrace. I missed you all, little Curly. Using the affectionate nickname he'd given her when they were children. I would love to tell you of my adventures, but first I have to report to the guild. You're quite right, young man. Get a move on. The dark eyes of his father Bray glowered beneath shaggy white brows as the thick-set man strode toward him on squat, muscular legs. But the stern expression on that weather-beaten face soon gave way to a broad, toothy smile. "'I always knew you had it in you,' Bray stated proudly, too loudly to be meant for Gorin and Ailey's ears alone. "'A strong branch off the old family tree. There is no doubt in that.' his father added, as a crowd of onlookers gathered. You are the most talented apprentice the guild has seen in many an age. That is what they all said. You will be a grand master one day. Goran felt his face reddening with embarrassment. As you say, father, I best be off to the guild hall, he said, shaking Bray's proffered hand, and then several more as he resumed his course down the street. I will come home as soon as I can. Please do, Gorin. Ailey called after him. We will be sitting down to dinner shortly. The spread we have prepared will astound you. And yes, you need not even ask. That includes your favorite, roast grouse with gravy. Gorin's mouth watered. Then the mention of grouse reminded him of the human hunter he'd just met. Daniel Boone had proved to be a skilled tracker and brave hunter. He was also intelligent and curious. The other humans Gorin had met in his travels seemed small by comparison. Most never noticed Gorin at all, due to a mixture of inattentiveness and Gorin's spell song. Of those humans who did catch a glimpse, or to whom he chose to reveal himself, some fainted at the sight. Others, convinced Gorin was a demon or ghost, tried to attack him or to flee. None escaped his memory charms. Daniel hadn't either. Goran thought sadly. It was, he supposed, a shame that such a refreshing curiosity would have to remain unsatisfied. But that was the way of things. The guild hall of the rangers was just north of the village square, its stone walls adorned with brightly hued banners and ringed at the top with sculptures depicting a wide variety of magical creatures. The menagerie included many that Gorin recognized readily from his studies, or from the fabulous stories that his father Bray and other retired rangers had told around the dinner table. A few shapes he now knew from personal experience. Some statues exhibited outsized or oddly misshapen forms of animals that would have been familiar to any human. Felines, canines, ursines, bovines, equines, cervines, Porcines, Rodentia, Avians. Others, Goran thought, would appear fantastical, even to imaginative humans such as Daniel, fish-like creatures of sea, lake, river, and bog, spheres of light and spirits of shadow. Serpents with two legs or four, serpents with three heads or nine, serpents with wings, with fins, 
with the beaks of birds or the jaws of lions. Some forms were stranger still. Gorin ascended the steps and knocked on the massive doors of ash and bronze. Soon, as a journeyman, he'd be able to push his way right in. He wouldn't need to knock, but not just yet. The doors creaked open. Well, apprentice Gorin, it took you long enough, said the owl-faced sylph who beckoned him inward. We expected you to transport with the hunters, not to take the scenic route. But perhaps you have grown so fond of the blur that you decided to linger a bit among the English. It has been known to happen. Gorin wasn't fooled. He knew when he was being teased. I could not have been more than a few minutes behind the hunting party, Saradon he said, pretending offence. It only took me about half an hour of blur time to reach the knob, and, yes, while I lingered among the English, it is only because I had to sing a memory spell. Saradin and Gorin had been walking along the hallway toward the council chamber. Now the older ranger halted and faced the young man. Yes, I heard about that, he said, a little hesitantly. There is always a chance of encountering humans on larder or monster hunts. Each of us has had the experience, but rarely do we enlist a human's aid. Did you really deem that wise? Gorin looked back at his long-time teacher, now less sure he was being teased instead of scolded. I had no choice. My flute was broken by accident. Without the keen ears of the human, I would have lost the quarry. Saradin cocked his head sideways and considered. There are worse things than a failed ranging. You could have returned home and gotten a new instrument. Perhaps the catawampiri would still have been in the area. Or perhaps you would have had to embark on a new journeyman trial. Involving humans in hunts invites danger. Gorin offered a deferential nod of his head. I understand your words, Saradin. But there was something about Daniel that inspired confidence. Besides, I knew that even with a broken flute, I could still cast a memory spell. Such a spell can treat the memory, Gorin, but it cannot treat a broken limb, or worse, a broken neck, Saradin responded. Still, all rangers must make judgment calls. I suppose you did what you thought best. You can explain it to the other guildmasters. They have assembled to receive your report and evaluate your trial. Saradin preceded Gorin into the council chamber, where a dozen rangers, ranging from middle-aged to elderly, sat behind a semicircular table. Goblets of wine sat before each, as did plates filled with pastries and sweetmeats. The sight reminded Gorin of his own hunger and thirst. He resisted the impulse to seek refreshment. Now was the time to report and he knew his family had a celebratory feast waiting. The most ancient of the rangers, Grand Master Kono, clapped his hand to silence the others. We welcome you home, Apprentice Gorin, and congratulate you on the successful capture of your quarry, the elder said with a quivering voice that nevertheless commanded the guildmaster's rapt attention. We are eager to hear the details of your ranging, and the lessons you have taken from it. Goran complied. He told the masters about receiving his assignment from Saradin, who'd relayed stories of mysterious attacks in the Carolina backcountry. He told them how the details of the attacks had convinced him some kind of monstrous feline, likely a catawampiri, was responsible. Goran described the painstaking process of surveying the countryside, flying by night and moving stealthily through forests by day, singing and playing summoning spells to entice the cat. On two earlier occasions, he explained, the beast had responded to the call, but was so far away that even Goran's most skillful spells had failed to pinpoint its location. For weeks he had tracked the beast, stopping only to eat rest, and avoid the occasional human hunter, trapper, or party of settlers. Finally, in what was nearly two days ago in the blur but only a couple of hours to the sylphs of the knob, he'd picked up the trail. After sending a preparatory signal, he'd headed after the beast. Goran related his encounter with Daniel, his decision to enlist the human's aid, 
and the final confrontation with the monster. Then he fell silent. The guildmasters looked at each other, some conversing, some speaking more with their eyes than their tongues. Presently, Kono spoke again. Apprentice Gorin, the Catawampiri is one of the most elusive magical creatures in the wilds of the New World. The only event of your report that strikes us as noteworthy is your decision to attack the bear to save the human hunter. While we wish no harm on any human, you could have been injured or killed during your rescue, leaving the Catawampiri to continue ravaging the countryside. Explain yourself. Goran looked at the floor for a moment, then lifted his gaze and squared his shoulders. It was an impulsive thing to do, he admitted, responding first to Kono, and then looking each guildmaster in the eye in turn. I do not have a clear explanation. It just seemed wrong to let the human die before my eyes, not when I had a chance to save him. Another guildmaster, a small man with graying temples and a long, thin nose, cleared his throat. Gorin, to say that something is noteworthy is not necessarily to say it is wrong, said Bren, a long-time friend of his father's. I, for one, think your actions were admirable. We are all quite well aware of your thoughts on the matter, Bren, said yet another master a burly sylph with a shiny bald pate and a massive grey beard extending halfway down his nut-brown tunic. Your voice at council is ever for greater engagement with humans. Where the rest of us see peril, you see opportunity. Yes, I do, bother, And why not? Bren answered, the volume and pitch of his voice rising in his excitement. For generations we have seen our humans merely as providers of sustenance. We send our rangers to human homes to obtain food, cloth, building materials, precious metals. They make offerings. They give us what we seek in exchange for a few magic tricks. We profit from their superstitions. And what really do we offer in return? What indeed? snorted Borva. We risk our lives to truck and capture the monsters that would otherwise overrun and slaughter them. What we get in return for this service is scant payment, to my mind. Borva only scratches the surface of the truth, Grandmaster Kono broke in, and the others fell silent. What our humans receive from us goes beyond just protection from beastly attack. There is much more to it as we all know. Almost all of the seated rangers nodded in assent, some vigorously, some more hesitantly. Bran was the exception. I agree that our actions sometimes benefit our charges, he told his fellow guildmasters, but it is not by design. We protect our humans much as they protect their own herds of cattle and flocks of sheep, and for the same reason, because the safety of the herd is in our interest. The difference is that humans are not cattle or sheep. They are reason and beings. Borva again snorted derisively. In my experience, human behavior rarely meets that test, he insisted. I have found them to be ignorant, simple-minded, and violent. Even the best of them suffer from impatience, arrogance, and perpetual dissatisfaction. They have no facility for spellsong, magecraft, or any of the higher arts. Their appetites are insatiable. They enslave their fellow humans and treat them like beasts, and they are constantly at war. I will remind you that warfare is hardly confined to the human realms, Bren said icily. We have warred with other folk from time to time, with the Pixies of the Cornish coast, with the Gwythian and Koblenai of the Welsh highlands. And have you so soon forgotten the border conflicts that promoted us to leave the human colony of Pennsylvania for another new home? Our memories are quite intact, Bren, 
replied Grand Master Kono with a sharpness that startled Goran. We need no reminders. And, as you also know, we undertook our southward journey from Pennsylvania for many reasons, not just because of border conflicts. Besides, the Council of Elders has already discussed your ideas at great length, and found some of them persuasive. Even the latest orders brought over the sea from our own King Briafel bear some similarities to your argument for more engagement with humans. So why are we debating here? This is an examination judgment, not a council meeting. Both Bren and Borva bowed their heads in acknowledgment of the Ancient One's authority. Goran, said Kono, returning his attention to the young ranger standing before them. Thank you for your service. You will be judged fairly by the masters of your guild. If you are invited to become a journeyman, you will be assigned your first long ranging. That is all for now. You are excused. The table was set for six, but there was food enough for thrice that many. Salads of tossed greens and crisp vegetables, platters of sliced fruits and cheeses, trays of roasted grouse, turkey, and pork, a huge bowl of steaming rabbit stew, sausages of venison cured and delicately spiced, trout pan-seared in butter, Loaves of freshly baked bread, cakes, cobblers, and pies. Goran sat to his father's right, the place of honor, longing to grab at the roast grouse. Weeks in the blur eating field rations, wild onions, and an occasional charred haunch of rodent had left Goran famished. Just how ravenous had not become evident until he neared the house and smelled the aromas of Ailey's handiwork. His pace quickened, his pleasantries little more than perfunctory when he reached the doorway. Almost immediately, Goran was sitting at the table, awaiting his father's blessing and the beginning of the feast. Both came quickly. For the bounty before us, we give thanks to the Maker of all things, Bray intoned, as we do for the victory we commemorate today. Then the clanking and chewing began. Welcome back, brother, said a broad-shouldered sylph, sitting across from Goran, as both began lifting generous portions onto their plates with their hunting knives. Caden, his elder brother, had joined the Warriors' Guild two years before the standard age of admission. Demonstrating impressive skills of body and mind, Caden soon commanded his own squad and was studying advanced warcraft with his guild's grandmaster, General Iron. I was drilling my spearmen today, and could not join the hunting party. I trust the battle was a glorious one. Goran had just stuffed his mouth with a hunk of bread dipped in stew. He waved helplessly to Caden, swallowed so quickly he nearly choked himself, and then took a drink of ale. As it turned out, he said momentarily, the battle was fairly short. You might have been a bit disappointed, Caden. Now it was his brother's turn to finish chewing before replying. I have never battled a catawampiri before, but the tales say it is massive and dangerously quick. Did your fearsome prey turn out to be nothing more than a little kitten? Or an old grandmother cat on her last legs? Caden's friend Jodok exploded in guffaws, nearly spraying Ailey with half-chewed trout. She glared at the young soldier, who immediately began profuse apologies as she turned up her nose. It was a pattern Gorn had witnessed many times before. Jodak was very interested in Ailey. She was very uninterested in him. Although Caden initially flashed a mocking smile, his expression quickly turned apologetic. I meant no disrespect, brother. Just making a little jest. Gorin believed him. As children, the two had quarreled, as siblings do, but they also had great affection for each other. Gorin was immensely proud of Caden's prowess as a soldier. He could tell Caden felt the same way about his little brother's ranging. Of course, Caden, Gorin reassured him. To answer your original question, the reason we took down the monster so rapidly 
is that it sustained a wound from an instrument of human design, a hunting weapon called a rifled musket. His brother perked up at the mention of weapons. The Warriors Guild has been studying gunpowder, cannons, and muskets for many years, ever since rangers brought samples from the blur. Caden said, We have even heard lately of cannons with grooves cut into their barrels to spin the metal shot and make it more accurate. The humans call that rifling. Are you saying they rifle their shoulder weapons too? Some do, it seems, although I do not know how widespread the practice is, Goran said. The weapon has a very long barrel, and it takes quite a while to reload. It is a useful tool for hunting, but I am not sure how practical it would be in a pitched battle. Caden looked intensely interested. I will ask my captain about this tomorrow. Most human guns are too large and heavy for us to wield, even if we could get enough of them to outfit more than a handful of warriors. As for making our own shoulder weapons, I understand that the craftsman guild has tried. So far, they have failed with bronze and brass. The humans often use iron, but, of course, iron and magic do not mix well. Goran cut off another hunk of bread and put it on his plate. I will ask if there is an updated ranging report on human musketry. I can pass along, he said. At the very least, if our folk could produce a few rifles and learn to use them as Daniel did, it would make both our larder and monster hunts easier. Making things easier does not necessarily mean making them better, Bray cut in, sounding annoyed. Do not be so quick to throw out the tried in the true. The old ways have served us well. They have filled our tables and defended our borders for generations. I will take tradition over comfort any day. I have no taste for ease, father, Caden said. Our soldiers train hard and well. The Warriors' Guild is as strong as ever, and I would still rather have a good bow or stout spear in my hands than some human contraption belching smoke and fire. But what if some other folk figure out the secret of firearms? We owe it to our folk to be prepared for anything, even if that means borrowing an idea from humans. It is not as if we shy away from borrowing other things from them, Jodak said laughing at his own joke and glancing not so discreetly at Ailey for a sign of approval. It never came. Always be prepared. That is what I always say, said Bray. He looked back at Caden. I am sure your guildmasters know best. Just as the masters of our guild know what is best for ranging. Speaking of, Gorin, when will you receive their judgment of your application? Gorin smiled. I am not sure, father, but after a meal like this one, the prospect of some rest and relaxation with my family is sounding better and better. Perhaps it will take the masters a week to make up their minds, or a month. It took only a single day. Gorin was at the back of the house the following afternoon, fixing a door latch, when he heard a knock on the door and Bray's deep, loud voice conversing with someone. When he came around to the front, he saw his teacher, Saradin. "'It is time, Gorin,' he said simply. "'Pack up your kit and come with me to the guild hall. I shall wait.' Gorin went to his room to get ready. He pulled out two clean tunics, an extra pair of stockings, a bedroll, and his hooded travel cloak. He stuffed them in his knapsack, then filled his pocket pouches with writing paper and his spare spell-song flute feeling its familiar contours and finger holes as he stowed it away. He strapped on his hunting knife and picked up his unstrung bow and quiver of bronze-tipped arrows. Compared to that of hunters and soldiers, ranger equipment was sparse and light. Yet he still felt the weight of responsibility as he turned to make his goodbyes. He supposed he ought to have been more excited. Saradin wouldn't have asked him to pack if the news were bad. But he had hoped for more of a respite. I did not think your first journeyman mission would come so soon, Ailey said, wiping a tear from her eye with one hand and pulling him forward for a kiss with the other. This time you may be gone for more than just a few days. Here, put these in your pouch. She handed him several thick squares of cornbread and a roll of venison jerky. 
you are headed back out so soon because you impress them so much. A beaming bray assured Goran. He clapped his son on the back and turned to Saradan. Is he not a branch off the old tree, my friend? Did I not tell you? Bray clearly had, many times. Saradin nodded his head good-naturedly and motioned for Goran to follow. When they reached the guild hall, Saradin paused for a moment at the door. You have done well, Goran. You are about to take a new and fateful step in a long journey, in a lifetime of service. The masters think you are ready. I think you are ready. But you must know you are. Goran took the old ranger's hand. He understood, even if he wasn't as sure of himself as the moment required. Will I ever be truly sure? he thought. Ranging was an unpredictable and varied profession. You had to be part scout, part hunter, part scrounger, part diplomat, and wholly committed to the safety and well-being of your folk. Goran had studied, he had trained. He should be up for what lay ahead. Was he? Time to find out. They walked into the council chamber. A much smaller cast of characters greeted him this time. The aged Kono, the pensive Bren, and the irritable Borva. Welcome back, Ranger Goran, said the latter, his long beard trembling as he spoke his words forcefully. You have been awarded the rank of journeyman. May you range long, range wide, your song, your guide. Range long, range wide, our song, our guide, echoed the other sylphs, repeating the familiar chorus of their guild spell song. Borva pointed to an empty chair. Goran sat. Ranger Goran, began Kono, what I tell you is meant for your ears and ours alone. You are bound by the code to secrecy and to the successful completion of your mission. Understood, Grandmaster, Goran replied. While you were in the blur, the Council of Elders received a ranger sent all the way to the knob from Cornwall, from King Briafail himself, Kono began. His message generated significant debate among the Guild Grandmasters. We understand its import, and are obligated to carry out the king's directives. Still, there are mysteries and uncertainties here. Borva, his arms crossed over his barrel chest, grunted his assent. Bren stroked his chin and looked searchingly at Goran. In brief, Briafel expressed concern about the current state of human affairs, Kono continued. Their realms have been unstable for as long as folk have recorded their history, since the bygone days of the arrival. Of late, however, the events of the Blur have become even more turbulent, more unpredictable. Kono paused, seemingly shaken. Bren cleared his throat and picked up where the Grand Master left off. Goran, King Briafel observes that the kingdoms of Europe continue to be at constant war. For the most part, we folk seek to stay out of such conflicts. But as long-time residents of Britain, and now of the British colonies in America, we do have an interest in making sure the balance of power is maintained, that the crown maintains its authority over all the lands we inhabit. We also have, I might add, a moral obligation to lift up those humans among whom we have lived for generations. You may keep your personal opinions to yourself, Bren, snapped Borva. This is not about the welfare of humans. It is about your own protection. With any domination of the humans by a foreign power would inevitably come domination by a foreign folk. This is our domain. We will not surrender to the goblins of Paris, the duendes of the Spanish plains, or the kabouters of the Dutch marshes. Be that as it may, 
began Kono, his voice once again calm and authoritative. We have been ordered by King Briafel to find out more about potential threats to Britain's North American colonies. You, Gorin, will act on our behalf in these matters. The young ranger looked in stunned belief at the three masters across the table. Why me? he heard himself ask. This sounds like a complex matter of intelligence and diplomacy. I am only now a journeyman. Surely a more experienced ranger would. Silence, Gorin, said the Grand Master, not unkindly. It is not your place to challenge your guildmasters. Your duty is to carry out your assigned mission. Or, if you wish, you could refuse the assignment, Borva suggested with a mocking leer. We do not conscript into the Ranger's Guild. Perhaps this pursuit is not for you. Perhaps you would be better suited to your late mother's occupation of green weaver, or to your father's current occupation of village. Borva stopped short, seeming to realize he'd gone too far, but disinclined to make apology. The other two masters glared at him, then turned their attention back to Goran, whose face had reddened. I meant no disrespect, said the young ranger, nor did I mean to suggest hesitation. I accept the assignment, of course. I will do my best to live up to your expectations. Kono gave a brief nod and leaned back wearily in his chair, eyes closed. Bren smiled and inclined his head in approval. Borva merely gave Goran a sideways, sneering look as if to say that living up to the level of his expectations would require no great effort on Goran's part. Chapter 3 The Wagoners July 1755 Daniel was sick to death of stumps. He was sick to death of mud. He was sick to death of bouncing up and down on a rough wooden seat as he drove his wagon slowly over the stump-filled trail and, sick to death, of having to climb down to help work his wheels out of mud-filled ruts. He was sick to death of the sheer boredom of his months-long trek, first from the Yadkin River Valley into Virginia with the Carolina militia, then to Alexandria, then along the Potomac to western Maryland, and now deep into Pennsylvania. Daniel was sick to death of living on musty bread and rancid meat. He was sick to death of weary days and restless nights. He was sick to death of arrogant British officers and contemptuous British soldiers. He was sick to death of the whole affair. The one thing Daniel Boone wasn't, for which he was most grateful, was quite literally sick to death. The same couldn't be said for some of the other men who marched, rode, or chopped their way into Pennsylvania with him. The afflicted looked deathly ill, doubled over in pain, incapable of keeping down food and water. Some had stumbled along with the column, others had given up. At least Daniel hadn't seen a man die from the bloody flux or one of the other diseases afflicting the expedition although he'd seen many a poor horse succumb to excessive exertion and inadequate fodder. That is, he corrected himself, he hadn't seen a man die yet. Perhaps that was about to change, given the miserable condition of the young officer lying in the back of Daniel's wagon. While their pace seemed pitifully slow, his lightened wagon was moving fast enough to pass the other supply wagons and marching men following the newly cut road. A couple of days earlier, the young officer had, in between groans and grunts, ordered Daniel to unload all his cargo and race to the front of the column, where General Edward Braddock was preparing to lead his British regulars and colonial militia in an assault on the French stronghold of Fort Duquesne. That his passenger, an officer in the Virginia militia, was so desperate to reach Braddock and join the attack struck Daniel as ridiculous. The man was in no shape to attack anyone. In fairness, he looked every bit the soldier, big, six feet tall or more, with strong features chiseled into a broad, intelligent face. 
healthy, the young Virginian might have been an imposing sight, but sprawled in the back of Daniel's wagon, his head lolling from side to side, his limbs alternating between sickeningly limp and contorted in pain, the colonial officer just looked sick, perhaps even sick to the point of death. Daniel had come to like the young man, who he judged to be about the same age as his own twenty years. He prayed that Colonel George Washington wouldn't die, especially not in the back of his wagon. At first, Daniel's service as a wagoner and blacksmith for the Carolina militia had felt more like an adventure than an ordeal, and he'd believed their cause was a just one. Daniel had known many Indians growing up. He agreed with his father that whites and Indians ought to be able to live together and learn from each other. But in response to widespread Indian raids encouraged by the French, Daniel was willing to defend his former neighbors in Pennsylvania as well as his new ones in North Carolina. During the grueling march, though, Daniel's enthusiasm had faded. Still, there was a bright spot. The expedition had given him a chance to make new friends among his fellow wagoners. One of them, John Finley, told him tantalizing stories about a wondrous country beyond the high mountains, where the land was lush and the game was plentiful. Daniel was also delighted to discover that another wagoner was his own eighteen-year-old cousin, Dan Morgan. Seeing a throng blocking the road ahead, Daniel slowed his team and glanced back at his passenger. Colonel Washington was sitting up, his eyes glassy, but nevertheless taking in the scene around him. The rough road, such that it was, had only just been cleared. On either side, the trees stood tall and thick. As his eyes followed Washington's searching gaze into the forest, Daniel caught occasional glimpses of the blue coats of colonials and the brown shirts and skins of the handful of Indian scouts who had remained with the column. They were in the woods, screening the advance of the British regulars who were marching along the road in bright red uniforms. Daniel was glad he didn't have to wear a red coat. If the French and their Indian allies attacked, he thought, those in red would be the easiest targets. Driver, can you keep us moving? Colonel Washington asked. We must be getting close to the fort. I must reach General Braddock before he orders the assault. I can try, sir. Daniel replied, but if I may say so, you're in no condition to go into battle. I will manage, the young officer said, sitting up straighter and buttoning up his waistcoat. My duty is clear, and I have a score to settle. Daniel understood. He'd heard the story from John Finley. Two years earlier, George Washington had made his first trip to western Pennsylvania as a newly minted lieutenant colonel in the militia. His mission was to deliver a letter declaring the Ohio country a British domain and demanding that the French stay in Canada. The French rejected the demand. On the way back to Virginia, Colonel Washington had identified the spot where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers met to form the Ohio as an ideal location for a fort. But it was the French who got there first. They'd built Fort Duquesne. Sent out again with militia to challenge the French. Washington had built his own stockade, Fort Necessity, and recruited allies among the local Mingo Indians. When the Mingos found a small French force encamped between the two forts, Washington agreed to attack. Among the slain was a French officer. The man hadn't just been killed, he'd been scalped. The French were outraged and came to Fort Necessity to get their revenge. Vastly outnumbered, Colonel Washington had given up the fort. The formal surrender was written in French, though, so Washington hadn't realized he was admitting to a role in assassinating the French officer. Now, it was the British who were outraged. That was why General Braddock had come to America. That was why the British Redcoats and American militia were marching toward Fort Duquesne. That was why Daniel was there driving the wagon carrying George Washington to the front of the column. The young Virginian officer clearly had something to prove, and it looked like Washington wasn't going to let a bout of the bloody flux keep him from doing so. As the wagon approached the crowd blocking the road, 
Daniel saw that the cause wasn't a fallen tree or a wheel stuck in the mud. Some British officers were standing in a circle, along with a short, thick-set man dressed in buckskins. They were having a spirited discussion. Groups of soldiers stood a few paces away, leaning on muskets and taking the opportunity to rest their feet or drink from wooden canteens. "'That's General Braddock!' Washington exclaimed. "'We have arrived in time!' The young officer began staggering to his feet. "'Driver, what is your name?' Daniel looked dubiously at the still weakened man. Daniel Boone, sir. Mr. Boone, you have done me a great service, Washington said. Now I wonder if I may ask another favor. I must walk to General Braddock on my own power to show I am ready to rejoin the column, but I fear that if I try to carry my equipment I will stumble. Will you carry it for me and offer a shoulder if I need it? Daniel looked down at Washington's equipment, which consisted merely of a sword in its scabbard and a bedroll. Then he cast a questioning glance at the officer. I'll be happy to oblige, but I don't know if it will do you much good. Washington lowered himself gingerly from the wagon and began smoothing the wrinkles from his uniform. I have not come this far only to prove wanting when battle is joined. I am Braddock's aide-de-camp. I will not shirk my responsibility. Once on my feet and walking around, I will recover my strength. Daniel suspected Washington may have been reassuring himself as much as his wagoner, but said nothing. Instead, he picked up the officer's equipment and followed a step behind as Washington approached the group. "'Welcome, Mr. Washington,' said a distinguished officer in a resplendent uniform, I am surprised, but pleased to see you up and about. Thank you, General Braddock, Washington replied, standing ramrod straight. Providence has been kind, my health is restored, and I am pleased to return to your service. That is good news, Braddock said. He turned to the other British officers. Perhaps our beardless young American friend can help inform our conversation. He has been here before.